Welcome to HTTP2 and Quick, teaching good protocols to do bad things. Kate Pierce and Carl Vincent are going to tell us about it. And you are in South Seas ABE. If that's not where you intend to be, the doors are in the back. Before we start, a couple of notes. First, stop by the business hall, which is located in Bayside AB during the day, and for the welcome reception from 15.30, that's 5.30 for Americans, to 1900 or 7 o'clock PM tonight. The Black Hat Arsenal is on the Palm Foyer on level three. Join us also for the Pony Awards in Mandalay Bay BCD at 16.30. That's 6.30 PM. Sorry. 18.30? Yeah. Right. It's morning. Good morning. Have some coffee. Thank you in advance for putting your phone on vibrate and for taking that gentle hint. It makes it easier for the rest of us to ignore the ringing while you wait for your voicemail to pick it up. And without further miscalculation of times, Kate. <laughs> All right. Hi. Um, so starting with our own introduction rather than that. So I'm Kate Pierce, um, sick up on Twitter. Feel free to yell at me. People often do at conferences. <laughs> I am a senior security consultant at Cisco, customer focused uh, as a security consultant is. So the usual, break and report, uh, coaching the builders, and research of course. Um, and with me some distinguishing features, loud, yellow, or maybe that's just a loud yellow. Uh, because I show everyone this, I'm never going to get a better photo taken in my life at a conference. So don't expect to beat this one. <laughs> so awesome. It's just the most ridiculously <laughs> awesome photo. <laughs> and virus. Um, hi. Uh, I gotta learn how to use this clicker. Uh, my name is Carl. Uh, I break things for Cisco. I'm a security consultant. Um, yeah, this, most of this talk is really uh, some carryover research uh, from stuff that Kate had in the past and kind of the story behind it is she walked up to me one day and said, hey, I've got this idea for something scary. Can you build it? <laughs> and, and I guess I kind of did. So, I mean, really she's going to do most of the rambling about the internals of insanity that, that led up to the final product, but I will hit buttons and make things shiny. You'll break things. <laughs> okay, and so to start with that, I'm just going to start with a teaser. Highly contrived, of course, nothing particularly interesting. I was sitting there one day at home and I was thinking, well, what should I do? How about I look at the news? What have we got? I apologize for the local news headlines. This was literally what was there that day and it's not my fault. Um, okay, and after a while, nah, there's nothing I really feel like doing. For some reason I go back. Again, sorry about the weird headline. <laughs> All right, what's on YouTube? Maybe I can find something on YouTube to look at. Scroll down, what can I find? Anything that takes my fancy. Oh, oh, what about that? That looks, that's the latest fad. Yes, yes, look, let's look into Pokemon Go. And actually, no, it, I, I want to hear a Pokemon Go, not some guy walking down the street. All right, so I'm going in a couple of weeks to this place in Vegas, Mandalay Bay. Let's, uh, let's look that up. Okay, and that's where we are right now. But how do I get there? Or more importantly, how do I get there from somewhere I'm not? Because as I say this, I was sitting in Wellington, New Zealand. So I'm thinking, let's just put in a random place. Let's put in Spain and see how I get there from Spain. And again, Google Maps, nothing particularly interesting. So I think, well, I actually I do want to go to the Mandalay. Maybe I should uh, make some arrangements. I go to the email. I go to sign in. And then I remember something I did earlier. Something which should have stopped all of this functioning at all. <laughs> I blocked all TCP traffic at my firewall. This is an unmodified virtual machine running an unmodified Chrome browser. This is all stock. There is nothing I have done here. I have not got anything in the middle. And yet, with TCP blocked, it's functioning. This is not a canary build. This is a standard build. So what's going on here? If the firewall was blocking all TCP, what was it talking? UDP, specifically quick. 
which I'll get to a bit later on. So to give you another demonstration, which will be so quick again, why are sharks think so knows what it is? It's got all of these headers. So to give another demonstration, if I move on to some other traffic I was looking at, again, pretty standard. What's that? Well it looks somewhat like HTTP but also not. If I look on the wire, well that doesn't make any sense. If I decrypt the SSL, still doesn't make much sense. And then there's this thing called a decompressed header, which is where I start to see things which look reminiscent of HTTP, but definitely not HTTP. So what's going on here? What are these things? So what, what we're here to talk about today is some upcoming, oh, I'm sorry, some recent <laughs> web transport protocols. They're already upon us. So why is the world exploding? This should be pretty obvious to most of you in the room. We've got increasing scale everything, connection, count, connection, size. All of our websites are doing a lot more than they used to. It is now impossible to browse the web on a 56K modem. In fact, it's almost impossible on a 1 megabit sometimes. Everything is using more data, more connections, more domains, more of everything. When I dump it from the HTTP archive, you see this trend where everything is scaling up. Use Google BigQuery of the HTTP archive data. It's really handy for trending. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. So again, number of domains contacted, number of total requests going up. Roughly doubling in the last five years. Why is all of this happening? This is all happening because network communication needs capabilities for the world we're living in today that it wasn't designed for initially. HTTP approaches those to multiplex within TCP, but to simplify, and quick does not use TCP but it brings its own UDP transport protocol. And as I alluded to with the teasers, these fundamentally change the way your network behaves if you're expecting it to behave like what you've seen in the past. As for why you care, for some of you this will be obvious, so some of it's familiar problems. Things which we've seen before, technology shifts that are opaque, technologies that we cannot make sense of or understand. Uh, and also there are some new problems. There's some new fragmentation attacks and your network security may not be able to deal with those. So similar to what we have with the MPTCP, um, we'll get to that in a moment. So to be clear, and this is a personal opinion, not a company opinion, that's Cisco is a separate thing. <laughs> I like these protocols. They're more of a culture shock than a direct vulnerability. This is not something coming in to break you. This is a culture shock. This is something that is doing its own thing and you're coming in with your assumptions about how the world, how society, how your network works that do not fit. I like them. I want them to succeed. They're really, really good from the usability and the user experience perspective. Our tools and our people in this industry are pretty much completely not ready. And because I have to point this out, I'm covering two protocols in 30 minutes. Don't expect detail. Go and read the RFC. All right, background. Not just why is this happening, but how do we get here? So previous work that we did a couple of years ago was on multi-path TCP, which was taking TCP connections, binding them together into one logical data flow, which introduced some of these same sort of issues. And this is an offshoot from that in some ways, but I'll there was mainly some lessons for us. Lessons were that Anything that requires the OS is going to be slow moving. It requires operating systems to be rewritten, to be rolled out, and sometimes there's nothing you can do about older systems. And anything in the way, any middle boxes, any routers, anything that's trying to understand it and makes incorrect assumptions will, have bizarre, will result in really bizarre behaviors. And, and this is really what I think is a key thing here is there's this chicken and egg deployment problem. No one wants to put support for a protocol on their product until people are using it. No one wants to use it until it's supported. Now that this is far from the first technology to be affected by that multi-path TCP. Plenty of other things have had this problem. Until you can get that large enough critical mass for a network effect, no one wants to use it. And so 
the reason multibath TCP came about in the first place was because TCP doesn't really do some use cases we need today. High availability or link aggregation, multi homing, so if you're moving around in your mobility, in your mesh networking, TCP doesn't do those because it goes from an IP and a port to an IP and a port. Anything that changes any of those four things, you've got to start a new session. And that's a problem when your system is moving around very, very often between different networks, different ASs, between different NATs, or it's getting its address shifted on a NAT. And a key motivator is TCP is really chatty. It really wants to make sure that you get on before it continues. You bring an SSL and it's like, hi, 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 great, hi, 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 hi. And that takes a long time, particularly if you're in New Zealand and physics are annoying. If I have to do with 200 millisecond round trips, it gets really annoying. So, not just is it chatty, but it can't do anything until it's finished its introductions. And that can be a real problem when that handshake slows you down and when that handshake blocks the rest of your communication from proceeding. Multipath TCP tried to deal with those top four. HTTP 2 and quick deal with the bottom two. And there's some chatter in various um, bodies to bring some of those capabilities to quick. And if that happens, things get really interesting. However, and I alluded to this, while there are reasons you do want to change TCP, there are some reasons that that might actually be the wrong solution. So TCP has some characteristics that tend to make it much more difficult to change. So it's got a handshake design that by and large is immutable at this point. It's outside user space, as I said earlier, the operating system has to be involved. You can make a user mode TCP stack. I played with that. I tried to build one. I don't recommend that. It's a horrible week month. Sockets are a terrible thing across operating systems. Sockets are a terrible thing across <laughs> operating systems. Yes, they really are. <laughs> Especially when they're not always, yeah. Different conceptualizations in different OSs. And end of line blocking. TCP, if your window is full, until it's got the stuff at the start, it's not going to keep sending data. And that's a real problem if you've got a noisy channel or your window size is wrong. But if you can't change TCP, then what do you do? Well, some talk in the past was SCTP. Um, did well in some spaces, didn't exactly take off in the consumer space. And, and so, like multipath TCP, it had similar problems. Just, it, it required rewriting everything. And that was not desirable. Application layer solutions, yeah, and that's what HTTP2 and it's what Speedy do. And you also have UDP. What? UDP doesn't do anything. That's exactly the point. Most network devices treat UDP pretty much as just packets traversing a network. They don't try and do any state management in most cases. UDP just blindly sends and leaves everything to the application, which is why Quick uses it. As it traverses networks, and it gives you a lot of freedom to do what you want to do. So there are two journeys here to understand, two simplified journeys. TCP, multipath TCP, quick. They TCP, there was a shift to multipath TCP. For various reasons, that wasn't followed in a large, spa in a large deployment space. And quick came along, which took many of those lessons and has applied them for its own solutions to achieve many of the same goals. HTTP 2, uh, HTTP, HTTP 1, 1, Speedy, H2. Speedy and H2, very, very similar, but basically the key journey to remember here is HTTP 1, 1, to Speedy, and then Speedy is what HTTP 2 was built from. TCP, MP, TCP, quick. HTTP, speedy, HTTP2. So what? Yeah, have you seriously looked at how many security tools support these? You'll probably be going to a compository scotch afterwards. There aren't many. I would make a joke here about not many, if any, but only Kiwis would get it. <laughs> and nobody laughed, so I guess I'm stuck with Aussies. 
<laughs> yeah, it's really unfortunate how few things support these protocols. So, MPTCP, I said it, it took off and then the deployment sort of flattened out. Quick has rocketed. Quick is enormously out there. It's already in use, as I alluded to in the intro. Google properties, right now it's probably several percent of your traffic if you are allowing outbound UDP. Also, every instance of Chrome on Earth. Pretty much every instance of Chrome on Earth. <laughs> yeah, and that is, if you're wanting to know what's traversing your network, that could be a problem. But H2 has become real world even faster. Both of these things come along fast. So MPTCP, you've got mm, a good number of servers, an okay number of clients, probably actually higher than that. And it's only used for a couple of things. Well, quick, a whole lot more servers. Again, I'm just sort of guesstimating from Shodan. Over a billion clients. Well over a billion. Chrome, Duo, Google properties, and likely, depending on what the Google guys and the IETF decide, likely a lot more. But H2, that is H2's deployment. Just of the Alexa top one million websites. That, the start of that graph is January 5th, 2015. We start at about 10,000. By today, over, let's call it 15% of the Alexa top million websites are using this. That's a lot of websites. That's huge. That's billions of clients, hundreds of thousands of servers. If you didn't know this exists, you're going to have a really bad time. And those are just the legit ones that you know about. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, no, not, not what shady characters have put into their things. So again, top tw 20 Alexa websites of which I got 19, nine of them support it. So in this case, Facebook, Google, Twitter, Wikipedia, Yahoo, YouTube, Instagram, the large technology companies are pushing these because they, they give them a lot of benefits too. Anyway, what are these protocols? Enough talking around them, what are they? So they have the goals of improving performance. They have goals of improving latency. And in many ways, because they're multiplexed, their goal is to use a single connection rather than opening up a whole lot of different connections. That's what a multiplexing protocol is. And the reason I'm talking about these two together is because right now there is a, r they're basically intertwined. There's a lot of goal and use case overlap. And if you understand them together, that helps you understand them independently somewhat better. There are some common features. Multiplexing is, I keep saying, you have prioritized requests. So not only is it multiplexing, but it's not multiplexing naively. It's saying you're sending this down this, I'll get to the structure in a moment. It's prioritizing and it's compressing. To give this a visual example which um, is pretty, right now if you want five resources in parallel you open up five connections. That's what we do in TCP. What actually happens across the wire is more like this. It breaks it down into chunks using time division multiplexing. Well why would you use multiple connections when you can just do that? That is multiplexing. Chunking it and sending chunks across, that is exactly what all of our protocols do. It's what all of our packet switching protocols do. A single connection contains some number of streams. Now, to bring that down to these protocols, with HTTP 1, if you want a connection over TLS, you open up H1 over TLS over TCP, because there'll be a wire. And you have to do that again if you want multiple things in parallel. The way H2 does it is if you open up all those connections, it shares a common connection state, which goes over one TLS session and one TCP connection. That is multiplexing in action. Why use multiple carriers to the same endpoint? Why use multiple connections when you can just use one and achieve the same thing? And H so HTTP is 20 years old, Uniplex, text based, runs over TCP. Should all be pretty obvious stuff to you. But what H2 does is it encapsulates it to add binary framing. 
It's not tech, not human readable anymore. Multiplexing, so it's not linear anymore. Prioritized, so you can't even predict what order things are coming through. And uh, compressed, so you have to decode it statefully. It's a stateful compression. And server push streams, so you can get resources sent that you never asked for. Also mandatory encryption. Uh, and mandatory encryption, which for some reason isn't on here. It, yeah. There are uh, upgrades messier, but generally, yeah, mandatory encryption. Yeah, just in the implementation, not in the RFC. Yeah, so I was trying to simplify it. But it's mandatory over quick. So if you're using HTTP2 that's over right. quick, you still have to use it. Yeah. Yeah. In most implementations, it will be um, encrypted. Yeah. So the way two is structured, again, simplified. You have a transport layer, which has frames. Each of those frames has a header and a payload. And you have multiple frames over your transport layer. Again, for details, look at the RFCs. And, the way that, and then if you layer that up some more, your frame payload itself contains other headers. So it nests at another layer. But the way that, that actually breaks down on the wire, logically, is you have a transport layer, which has a string, starting with one. A stream has some number of bidirectional, it's a bidirectional communication channel, which communicates via frames with all of that stuff I just zoomed through. Frames going in both directions. And you have a lot of streams. So a connection is comprised of streams. Streams communicate with frames. Binary framing. Anyway, H2, one connection per origin with a number of bidirectional binary frame streams per connection. Pretty much what I said. Um, and the identifiers per stream are integers. 31 bit unsigned. A couple of key things to know about those if you're ever playing around with an implementation, they're never reused. They are always increasing. They are always odd for a client, always even for a server. If you break that, you'll get really bizarre protocol errors, which is a nightmare to debug. Isn't it, Lars? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I blame Google. Ooh, gloves are off. <laughs> yeah, so again, read the docs on that. Uh, it's, it's interesting to look at. Connection setup, and this is where you should start to see some of this. If you have no prior knowledge, you have an upgrade header. If you have no prior knowledge and you speak H11, you have an upgrade header. In this case, to H2C, clear text, if it's coming from um, a non-encrypted HTTP session. It would be H2 if it was over an HTTPS session. Or if you have no prior knowledge, and this is what you'll probably see, you have ALPN, which is an SSL header, extension header, which will give you an H2 as the application layer protocol it wants to negotiate. I recommend you don't use NPN anymore because it doesn't work. So if you're looking at NPN, again, you're going to have a bad time. Yeah, so as mentioned, H2 is the encrypted variant. H2C is a clear text variant. Generally, you're going to see H2, not H2C. Now, if you do have prior knowledge, uh, it gets a little more interesting. And this comes down to what I gave in the teaser. You have this prism header. Pry star HTTP2 RN RN SM RN RN. It's really funny reading the mailing list for why they chose Prism, but that's a, I leave that as an exercise to the reader. <laughs> yeah, so if you see Pry star HTTP2 inside uh, a connection, that's the start of an HTTP2 session. Connection, sorry. I mentioned those frames earlier. They have their own header structure, which is variable length, um, and has various types. Again, not going into the details here because I'm trying to introduce them. The key ones you're going to want to know about out of this are the headers, data, 
So headers is where you send your HTTP2 headers. Data is where you send your request and response data. Uh, what other ones? You probably want to know about reset stream, which kills a stream, and go away, which is the equivalent of a, um, an MPTCP connection close or a TCP reset. It just shuts down the whole thing. And the servers and the clients that are implementing this are already starting to vary in the way that they implement the handling for different frame types. So yep. insert, insert drama with the same drama we had with TCP being around for years and different flags coming back as different stuff. Well, we found this last night. We were optimizing for one implementation yeah. and it didn't work with another implementation, which is Because kind of we changed the URL. We changed the URL and so it changed. One of them was sending us a ping and the other one was sending us a settings frame and it, it's, a, it's a protocol. So you need to treat it as a protocol. You can't pretend it's linear anymore. Compression, a whole other standard of its own. The HP Act compression stuff, really, really fascinating. Static table of common entries. So anything you'll see regularly, any methods, any common paths, user agents, all sorts of things are in that static table. Basically, why would you repeat something you're going to say a thousand times? There's also a dynamic table, and this is where it gets a little more interesting, because that dynamic table is made up of your previous request and response bodies and bits that it used to see that dictionary. That will change. It's got a cap on its size, so you can't go inflating it too much. Anyway, pitfalls. Connection reuse is a fun one. Um, the short of it is if you have multiple FQDNs resolving to the same IP using the same cert, it won't bother opening a connection to each different domain. It will just open one connection mm -hmm. and talk to them all. Which is interesting if you're not expecting it. Also with HTTP2 push, this makes uh, pure domain origin uh, enforcement fundamentally impossible without going into the application layer because you can fundamentally connect to a different domain via a push request and the browser has no way of telling the difference between a, a push request from a domain that is quote unquote valid or a push request that isn't because it's pushed by nature. So. It puts a lot of trust in the browser. Yeah. Which is server push. Those are some things which in particular I think if people treat them naively they're going to be in really big trouble. So Quit takes those things and pushes them all the way down to the network layer. It combines encryption and its connection handshakes into one. It doesn't negotiate them independently. Basically read the documents on that. There are a lot of them. They are scattered. They are fascinating. They change a lot. Because it's application layer, because it's IETF, because you've got different source code is often the best documentation unfortunately for certain aspects. Sadly, the only source code out there to read is Google's quick implementation, and I pity the fools <laughs> that attempt to read that. Yeah, we may have done that. Okay, so I said earlier that H2 basically takes the common transport layer. Well, Quick does that, much the same on the top bit, but it pushes down the Quick connection, which has, let's call it TLS in this case, depending on which version you read integrated in it and over UDP. And it pushes the HTTP2 streams and frames right the way down. It handles the framing and streams and the sending across the network. It doesn't just throw them into a transport now. This makes far more sense in a packet capture than it does conceptually. It's really elegant in a packet capture. So yeah, Quick manages the streams if it's the transport. And this is what I mean when I say they are intertwined at present. If you're using H2 over Quick, uh, the logical separation is not as clean as it is in other spaces. So Quick, which I should have defined earlier, Quick UDP Internet Connections. That makes me really terrible as an academic. I'm not an academic, so I'm okay. As a UDP transport protocol, as said again and again and again, a Google champion successor to Speedy, latency optimized. Quick's thing is all about latency. Reliable, multiplexed, even though it's over UDP, it is reliable. It's always encrypted. 
open source, user space. Because it's user space, there's no operating system requirement. It's incredibly fast evolving. Yeah, the big one there is that um, while you can restrict ports and all the usual places, uh, to build a fully coherent quick session, you don't need to use a socket like you do with any TCP connection. Even under TCP, if you're doing fancy stuff where you're dropping raw packets on the wire, you still need to open a socket port to do that with the way that quick is implemented. None of that is necessary, so that makes it harder from yeah. uh, identification on a host. Yeah, a quick packet has frame packets, and each frame packet contains some number of frames. So to give you the same sort of diagram of quick, UDP, which has a quick header, public header, so that's readable, but it's also authenticated, and authenticated and encrypted data after that. Inside that authenticated encrypted data, you have a private header, a frame packet, which has some number of frames. You can read the UDP and the public headers, but they are authenticated. The public header is authenticated. You cannot read that without the key. So there's not a lot of metadata to look at compared to some other protocols. Quick is set up similar to HTTP 2 with some headers, your old service header, or your alternate protocol header, which again you shouldn't be using. Anyway, that's not why you're here. What can a nefarious actor do? Why are these interesting or dangerous? Well, always encrypted binary fragment, blah, blah, blah. So a couple of things. Way more complex state. Many, many, many side channels. Uh, Quick is encrypted, verified back to previous connections and user space and all that. However, we're not talking about implementation flaws. There, may, there probably is a heap of them. That's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the effect this has on networks. There's probably all sorts of fun things to find in there, and I'm not <laughs> totally saying that without knowledge. <laughs> and insert typical speech about binary parsing. <laughs> so bad. Yeah. So bad. <laughs> it's a really, really complex protocol with really, really complex implementation requirements. And if you're doing that in low level or unmanaged languages, you've got to do it right. So, anyway, if we're using these protocols today, how does that work when we come across a proxy or an IDS? Well, and this is our first demo. Okay. Um, I apologize for all the screen copying in advance, some joke about. Linux and multiple desktops. Uh, so uh, what the slide uh, that you just saw showed, um, the purpose of this demo is to produce uh, effectively a tube. So we have H1 uh, in a standard server context on one end, and we have uh, H2 in between, slash quick in between, and then H1 on the other end. So you can have a client that makes a request, it gets quickified, and then the request comes out standard on the other side, and the idea is that if we are a nefarious actor and we're doing data exfiltration, or if our piping, in this case the example is gonna be a interpreter shell or anything else that we assume that we don't want a knock or a sock to see, uh, nothing reads this protocol in the first place, so I don't have to rely on the concept of perfect TLS because in this case my traffic isn't opaque, it's just invisible. Um, I know. So uh, here's my victim VM, which I downloaded off the intertubes from a standard Microsoft place. Um, and just so I can show what IP it's on, uh, so everybody knows what I'm going to call. Um, and now all this code will be public in some fashion as soon as Cisco and our wonderful corporate overlords figure out how they want us to release it. Um, but so this is the first half of the tube, which is uh, an H1 to quick uh, repro. And the two arguments that you see past um, this, this is the dialback port, which means that all the connections that it receives are going to get sent back over uh, this the uh, quick socket as it were, but I use that term euphemistically because quick doesn't have a literal socket. Uh, and then the listener, which is gonna be, in this case, the catcher for our interpreter shell. So our interpreter shell is gonna call home to this listener and it's gonna dial out over that port. And now the other half of our tube, not that, uh, there we go. Um, so this, you know, you have to, as we said earlier, uh, there is no implementation of Quick that currently does not support crypto, and there never will be, at least as far as the spec is concerned. So uh, you have to give it a key. Uh, for the purpose of this example, I've uh, installed the keys as a trusted root cert so that I don't have all the error messages that usually pop up on deployment. But 
Um, the implementations that are public, if you use SSL3, it does uh, insecure skip verify for you, so that's kind of the cheat code if you don't want to deal with SSL stuff. Um, and then I have my same, same topology where I have a dialback and I have a listener, and the dialback in this case is just going back to my Metasploit instance. So if I mouse over here to, uh, where'd it go? There we go. So here's my Metasploit terminal. See, I've got a bunch of listeners of a bunch of different types. And we're just going to use a standard uh, PS exec. Sorry, I'm trying to put that on one group. Um, the password and stuff you saw earlier. And uh, again, this is just going to call back to our, the beginning of that tube. Um, so it's not going to call back to the direct listener. It's going to get quickified on the way in. Uh, so I'm going to fire up Wireshark here if my computer will stop freaking out because the demo gods hate me. All right. And now we're going to go and punch up exploit. So it executes our payload, and then we get a session open immediately. So I'm going to pause my, my packet capture. And if you see, we scroll up here past all the noise that my computer is making, and all we see is a bunch of UDP. And you'll also note that since the port on these is non-standard, Wireshark has no idea what it is. This goes all the way down to any of the PCAP implementations that are out there right now. Uh, while there is relatively good support for dissecting this stuff in the wild, there's almost no support for detecting it strictly because of parsing issues. Um, and now in this implementation that I built here, which was a ton of work, um, this session is borderline unusable only because the way that Meterpreter works, uh, it requires what effectively reduces to uh, an HTTP 1 keep alive session, which it is possible to implement in QUIC, but almost impossible to implement with the code that is publicly available. There's only really two libraries that are robust enough to build this. Uh, if I wanted to build it in C, I would have had to build an HTTP server and client with full multiplexing entirely in C. And so for time, I attempted to use their Go fork because Google has been blessed with us enough to provide a Go export of their C implementation. Unfortunately, the people who wrote it clearly don't write a lot of Go because all they did was use CGO to export as much, as, they, as much stuff as they had to from C to use it, and none of that stuff is accessible from the developer without changing core fundamentals of the library, and it is not idiomatic in the way that Go is supposed to handle web traffic at all. So uh, a word, word to the, you know, warning to, to those out there who decide to start playing with this stuff, there be dragons. Virus's soapbox is filled with ghost stickers. <laughs> it's true. Um, but yeah, so if we, sorry, I'm, I don't have dual screens, so I'm <laughs> reading slides. Let's uh, follow UDP stream. So first we're going to isolate this stream. And, it, and I'm not going to do it here just because it actually takes a while for uh, the CPU to decode all the traffic. But even if I were to explicitly tell Wireshark that this is quick, um, you don't really get anything more than this in a live session because since the interpreter web request, even though it's legit, is so foreign to the H2 decoder, as an example of how bad most of these parsers are, it doesn't really get any better than this. You just get encrypted compressed garbage with kind of sort of little handshake nubs in there if you know anything about the protocol. But even when you tell it exactly what it is, you get a little bit of extra metadata, but no real information. All right. There we go. Cue Jeopardy music. So that is what Virus was just showing. Local H2 proxy, quick H2 app. Um, let's skip some for time. Feel free to come talk to us later. So multiplexing, as I said earlier, does this. You can also, when you put a multi-path, you get multi-connection. Whereas that multiplexing is a whole other bundle of fun to try and decode. And if we combine them, we get something like that. 
Now, I have done this already, uh, I talked about this last year, you can do this with even HTTP 1. However, if you do it with HTTP 1, what you get is you actually get that. Because it's simply breaking up between the two paths. With HTTP 2, because you can multiplex, you have chunks of your data flying across different paths, and if your IDS isn't get, seeing and correlating all of them, how do you make sense of that? Particularly if you have a shared cryptographic state across them all, in which case you miss it on one channel and you start not being able to make sense of any of them. FYI, we haven't found an IDS yet that will catch that. It's an architectural thing. How do you inspect traffic you cannot observe or cannot even see the metadata or flow data for? I don't know. And so that's, you know, the cross path fragmentation, splitting it up, agility, bouncing between paths, and you get a multi stream which is not just bouncing between paths, but within each uh, connection, bouncing between streams within that. And then agility which is not just bouncing between them but also killing some of them as you go and a lot of noise. You can bring in RF techniques to these multiplexings and things get really, really messy. Forward error correction was another fun one. For now it's been removed from Chrome so I'm not going to talk about it. But if you have FEC you can inject fake packets, you can drop or corrupt packets. Anyway, what do you do if you see all of this? What do you do if you want to understand or to block it for some reason? If you want to know client traffic, look for the ALPN, largely. Look for the upgrade headers. If you want to see the quick traffic, it's, it's much the same. You look for UDP ADN 443 outbound. That will only get standards compliant stuff that follows the current paradigms. It won't get people like virus doing UDP meterpreter tunneling. <laughs> Bidirectional patterns of communication. This stuff does not look like a l m most UDP traffic. It has different flows. There is no static identifier in the header. You have to parse it. There is no magic. There is no magic set of bytes. You have to understand this protocol to be able to make sense of it. And, and parsing this because of the variable lengths is actually relatively difficult. So this is why uh, arguably the best defense strategy right now if you're looking at deploying an IPS IDS in a web environment where you can almost guarantee that you're only going to get HTTP traffic is to actually just back proxy everything to HTTP 1. Yeah. So we have a quick detector which I w we can demonstrate during questions. For now I'm going to skip to make sure we don't run out of time. So the other thing you can do is you can detect servers. Um, if you want to detect H2 server, make a request to it with ALPN, see if it connects over H2, see if it answers with an upgrade headers. If you want to look for quick server traffic, you want to see inbound traffic on ADN443. Um, quick scanner. I don't think there's any of them out there. Nothing that will just interrogate. Do you speak quick? Yeah, the, the ones that are barely look at checksums. I'm pretty sure we've written the best quick scanner that exists, and it's like nine lines of code. And if you want to block it, then of course, if you want to block H2, terminate it. I personally would don't think you should block it because the market's against you. But if you want to protect your environment and you think these are a threat, Transparent proxies and termination just don't support it outbound. Uh, the upgrade headers, you want to deal to those, but if you can't miss them ever because the browsers cache them. So if you miss them once or if they talk to another path, <laughs> you're in trouble. You want to look for them on non standard ports, which is again difficult. So, quick 93% of the networks right now let this through. Outbound on ADN 443, you could block that. That's a policy decision. If you have Chrome, which is the main thing using this, you can deploy a policy to it that will tell it not to use this. That is probably the simplest way to deal with this in most cases. And then if you do see it, you know it's not something you're managing. The, that doesn't take mobile into account, though. That doesn't take mobile into account, yeah. You can fingerprint, detect, and parse quick. Uh, it's another tool which. I was going to demo, but again, time's a bit tight. So, anyway, you can analyze these. Uh, H2, as I demonstrated at the start, with the SSL keylog file, is really good to do in Wireshark. Chrome, it's all there too. Assuming it's on a port that Wireshark expects and assuming you tell it what it is. Otherwise, even if you tell it, it will have no idea what it's Absolutely. Like. Chrome DevTools are good for H2 and Quick. You have H2I, which is a fun little tool in Go that enables you to send arbitrary commands to arbitrary streams. NGHTTP, which for some reason has been clipped by my image. There's a lot of tools out there to support this, just not so much security tools. Well, with one exception. 
Curl has HTTP2 support, but that's not the exception. The exception is MITM proxy, which supports H2 now. Quick, again, Chrome, your best friend on this right now. It has all your alternate protocol mappings, your alternate service mappings, cached. There's a few from one of my browsers. Wireshark has a quick dissector. T Shark supports this if you give it the filters. If you want to inspect it, H2 is doable, and it'll be especially doable when vendors support it. Quick. Yeah, that'll take a while. Yeah. I'd say it's going to be a long time until most vendors are supporting Quick, at least an inspection. And I'd say there's probably a good chance that that will be seen as against the private use case of it, and measures will be made to prevent that. Because the things that we do to protect our traffic or to inspect their traffic are the same things people do to harm users. Anyway, conclusions, future work, other protocols, WebRTC over quick is a fun one. Yeah. Extending the multiplexing stuff some more. Multipath quick, error correction and quick. But tools have to keep up. They're not. I've talked to people about this and they're like, but no one's using it. Oh really? Here's the stats. Oh. If tools can't keep up, you need to at least know to look for this. And if tools and people are away, playtime is over. And that slide is way too small. You know what? I'll leave that up and we'll shift to questions. Or we can go to Carl's demos if people would prefer to see more demos. Mm, we should go to questions. <laughs> questions it is. Any questions? Sergey. <laughs> <laughs> Microphone? So, uh, for yeah. Did you see the evidence that they might be uh, auto generated? Uh, so, the question was uh, do any of the parsers look auto generated? Absolutely not. Uh, I have not seen any auto generated parsers. In fact, the best parser that we've seen that will actually dissect a single quick packet without being told that it's a quick packet in advance is actually NTOP, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, and the scanner that we ended up building is literally I took the C from NTOP, emulated it in Go in a few lines, and then added some extra checks because I know how the protocol works. And as I'm aware, nobody else even has that level of detection. So the question was how deeply are the structures nested? That depends on what layer of protocol encapsulation we're talking about. Um, HTTP2, uh, the slide with the black streams, that's all you're looking at. It's just TCP and TLS over the top of that. As soon as you start talking about quick, it gets weird because yeah. while the current implementations just take, HTT, H, take H2 frames and basically just turn them into quick frames, the spec doesn't say that that has to happen. And if you throw dual layers of TLS, crypto, and you know, stream muxing and multiplexing in between, I, that's, a, that's a nightmare to parse even for the best of parsers. It's a lot nested, to be technical. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> so. There are windows. There are windows per stream, and there is also there are settings to look. Yeah. Oh, does the protocol specify a maximum number of frames per connection or stream? So there, there is two to the thirty-one available stream identifiers. You can't use them all. So there's a number of streams. The num uh, you can limit the number of concurrent streams in your settings. In most cases, that's one hundred. Uh, as for how many frames go through, it's two to the 64. So it's, uh, it's a then, protocol. Then when you add multiplexing, you can mix streams and connections. So even those limits are kind of irrelevant yeah. from an application perspective. It's a lot of state to deal with. Any so you uh, so you mentioned the prior knowledge headers. Uh, can you, you do you see ways to use that to fingerprint clients? You could. Kay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, assuming, assuming that the client isn't lying to you, yes. Yeah. <laughs> However, they also have a very short lifetime in most cases. So they could be a super cookie within a certain length of time. I think the thing which I would argue is more likely to be it is actually going to be the alternate service headers 
and the domain associated with them, which is not a great deal different to what we do with various tracking right now. Yeah. Just sort of hand wavy, how long do they end up caching those values? Do the clients cache that? It's about 24 hours. So. Yeah, yeah, about a day. I mean, it, it, your mileage may vary. There's already been some binary parser bugs released in uh, H2 and some of the major browsers that have been patched, but I guarantee you that's not all of them, and I'm sure as the implementation bugs come, so will the attention, and so will the patch times decrease. You know. The usual insecurity, it has to get worse before it gets better. Yeah. <laughs> so, and another thing which we didn't mention, which is because this is application layer, because the code is available, you could put this in any application you're building. Only for good, of course. Demos notwithstanding. <laughs> and I hear the sniggers so people know my point. If you, get, if you get application layer transport protocols and malware, we're in real trouble. I think we're done. But the internet was designed that. The internet was designed end to end. We've deluded ourselves that it's not. Is that it? We're done. Is that everyone? Yeah.